I was thinking. No, no, that's not from me. Somebody else. From whoever. From whoever. There you go. Uh, Yeah, I wrote up uh, heroes in my version because, uh, to be honest with you, we never have a simple kind of Christmas. Mm -hmm. Give me a complicated Christmas. Lots of hurry and care. <laughs> Give me a complicated Christmas. Lots of hurry everywhere. I, 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 you know, I try not to, but it ends up with the travel and everything, and you're going to have a complicated Christmas. So we'd like a simple kind of Christmas. That's our goal, amen? Uh, but uh, a lot of times it ends up being a complicated Christmas and a lot of people have that. <clears throat> so uh, we need to have uh, compassion and understanding. Uh, a lot of people, uh, we think about this Lord's Day, uh, this coming Lord's Day and then Monday. Um, a lot of people will not have their family members with them. Uh, we're thankful. <laughs> Our problem is kids are going to be coming in with uh, their children, our grandchildren, but they're coming in at kind of different times. So uh, I was kind of saddened that we're not all going to be together at once, but it's just kind of the way things are. It, like I say, it gets a little complicated, right? <clears throat> And so, give me a complicated Christmas with a whole lot of worry and care. Complicated Christmas, uh, lots of worry, hurry everywhere. But <clears throat> that's not the way we want it, but that's the way it ends up a lot of times. So, <clears throat> Luke chapter 2, let's begin in verse 1. It says, and, there, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. You can imagine this, how busy this was. Uh, they couldn't pay taxes online, folks. Okay? Uh, and so everybody, notice it says here that all the world should be taxed. The Roman Empire reached around the globe. And so everyone had to go to their place of, uh, of heritage, so to speak. Like, for instance, I would go to San Francisco for a very brief time, believe me. I wouldn't stay there. But that's where I was born. So wherever you were born, you were going to go there and uh, wherever your heritage was to uh, pay your taxes. So it says in verse 3, And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. <clears throat> what does Bethlehem mean? Beth, Bayith, the Hebrew word Bayith, and Lechem. Uh, Bayith is, is, is house. Uh, Chem is bread. The house of bread. Jesus is the bread of life. And that's why he was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Amen? So, uh, other, I mean, there's so much meaning as you dig into this, uh, the Christmas account. And I had a missionary, we, we have a dear brother uh, who is down in Douglas, Brother Frank Chavez. And he says it this way. He says, blessed Christ birth. <laughs> blessed Christ birth. That's what we're celebrating. We're not celebrating a mass. Uh, I don't, I don't mind Christmas. Uh, uh, that mean, just means Christ sent. And so, but we celebrate the birth of Christ. Hey, if you celebrate Christmas, well, they, you know, these, these you know, uh, they have dissected the word and, and they have the last final authority on everything. So uh, they think that we shouldn't rejoice in the birth of Christ. I don't celebrate Christmas. I celebrate the birth of Christ. And... <laughs> I happen to think he was born around this time of year, and I'll bring you John, John Stormer, who's a lot smarter than I am. Uh, uh, I was in Bethlehem at this time of year, and don't tell me the shepherds aren't in the field. I saw them there, and, and, and the ewes were lambing at that time. Okay? 
So it was around this time of year in Bethlehem that we see that the ewes are lambing. And then, of course, uh, the winter solstice, uh, whatever equinox or whatever that is, no, the, the solstice, winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, Jesus was born in the light of the world to chase away the darkness. Amen. Amen. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, uh, the course of Abiah also speaks to us in the birth of John the Baptist. So I'll just leave it there. Uh, the bottom line is the Bible is very clear that if you don't want to celebrate, then don't. But don't, don't judge somebody else that wants to celebrate. Isn't that what the Bible says? That's right. Okay, one man, you know, uh, esteems one day above another, another esteemeth every day the same. So, you know what? I'm good with it. Either way, if you don't want to, don't. But we just rejoice in the birth of Christ. And uh, we see here, the Bible says in verse 9, <clears throat> Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Okay? And in verse 13, Suddenly there was with an, a, the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, what? Praising God and saying what? Verse 14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So if the angels rejoiced in the birth of Christ, and the shepherds rejoiced in it, and the wise men rejoiced in it, of course the enemies of the cross, they didn't rejoice in it. Herod did not. We know what he did, don't we? So let's go to verse 4. <clears throat> they went to his own city, verse 4, and let's read it together. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Everyone? And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to what? To the Americans. <laughs> to the Americans. Yes. To the Africans. Yes. To the South Americans. To the Canadians. Mm -hmm. To the Chinese. To what? All people. Amen. Got a wonderful report from Brother Al Brady this week. Uh, he... Uh, sent a little video. Maybe I'll show that if I can tonight. They reached their 12 millionth Bible this year, King James Bible. Praise God. You know, it's going around the world. And um, I praise God for bearing precious. He's going to be with us, I believe, in April. <clears throat> so we're looking forward to having him. But I want you to notice this uh, fascinating verse here. It says in verse 7, and she what? She brought forth, brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Let me ask you a question. Uh, and the Baptists like to beat up on Mary. And Catholics like to venerate Mary and lift her up to Queen of Heaven, you know. The fact of the matter is she was a chosen vessel of God, wasn't she? Yes. Okay. There was something special about her. God chose her to carry Jesus in her womb for nine months. Yeah. The Holy Spirit, the seed, the seed of Christ, was implanted within her womb. I want you to see this in something that we can apply to our own lives. And, and I'm stricken by these words. Are you not? And everyone, let's read the first four words. Everybody? And she brought forth. Amen. Something wonderful, someone wonderful was brought forth from this precious woman.
the fruit of her womb was Christ. I would say that she brought forth that fruit of her womb. I would say, Brother Bob, that that fruit, that's fruit that remains. Amen? Amen. For all eternity. We are commanded in our own life to bring forth fruit. Every word of God is pure. Amen. Right? Yes. Hallelujah. And she brought forth her firstborn son. I ask us tonight, today, if I could, if I was sitting with you, I would ask you, what are you bringing forth for God? Hmm. What am I bringing forth for God? What is the tree of my life? The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Mm -hmm. Right? What is the fruit of the tree of your life? I see in this verse something very precious. I see Mary as a living tree bringing forth the fruit. She was obedient, wasn't she? Yes. She wasn't perfect. I mean, go back across the page. Mary had to get saved, amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. But we see the Magnificat, what they call the Magnificat, right? <clears throat> and uh, chapter 1, verse 45. Blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which are told her from the Lord. And Mary said, everybody, and Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. 1, verse 46. And verse 47, everyone. Oh, I'm sorry, again. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Only sinners need a Savior, beloved. Mm -hmm. Mary received the gift of salvation in Christ. For he hath regarded the low state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call. Hey, hey, this is important. All generations shall call me blessed. Not blessed. <laughs> There's a difference. How you pronounce that, right? Certain churches would say, blessed. No, we call her blessed, right? For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. So Mary got saved, I believe. And though she didn't really understand all about who Jesus was, at the, what, you know, we understand that. They brought him to the temple, right? What are you doing here, you know? And, and you wish you not that I must be about my father's business. And we got that little glimpse into his life, not as a baby, but as a 12-year-old boy. Think of it. He was the perfect pre-born baby. He was the perfect baby in his birth. Isaiah tells us that before she travailed, she brought forth, right? You know what I was thinking? I was thinking, well, how about James? And how, about, how about the succeeding baby she had? Think of this now. This is a thought that kind of, I don't know if you've thought about this. Jesus' birth did not cause her the pain as a normal birth. And so when she had James, and, and it, you know, wow, that was a lot more painful than Jesus, <laughs> you know? Fascinating thoughts as you think about it. How did Christ govern the universe from that womb as a freeborn infant? Well, bless God, in a theological sufficientismist, he laid aside all of those attributes and gave it up to the Father. Well, okay. I guess we'll know more about that when we get to heaven. She brought forth her firstborn son. Praise God. Right? Mm -hmm. Alright. And what are we bringing forth? Wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And what does that mean? Those are death clothes, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Born to die. Ron Hamilton wrote a great program. And laid him in a manger. This means that 
He was not in a building. He wasn't uh, at the inn, obviously. The Bible says there was no room for them in the inn. And the fact that they laid him in a manger, basically they were in a stable, a barn. Or a cave. Right? A cave. Right? And that's what they used for, for their animals was a cave. And you can go to that church. I know they, you know, you go, you go into this church of, of, of the nativity. And you go in there, and you go down these steps, and they've got this 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 marble the, the, the area, and, and with a, a cross on it, you know, and and they have uh, you know whatever priests and and whatever liturgy uh, clergy around this, and they're supposed to protect it, you know. And so, this is the blessed place where Christ was born. I don't know if that was the place, probably not, <laughs> but it was in that area. It had to be. Because Bethlehem is not that big. It's maybe the size of 85705. <laughs> if even that. It's not even the size of this zip code. <laughs> so it had to be close. Close by. So, <clears throat> yeah, you go to the Bible land. You, you go over there and uh, this is where the Catholic Church says this happened. This is where the Eastern Orthodox Church said this happened. And, and you know, they got the whole thing inside the, uh, uh, you know, they got the, the, the uh, uh, whole, whole uh, death of Christ and all the rest of it inside the city. We know he didn't die inside the city, right? Outside. So that's why we believe in Gordon's Calvary. <clears throat> so here we are, beloved. Take your, uh, your uh, outline there, if you would. And it is a busy time. <clears throat> Next. <coughs> we live in this busy world. Our lives are frantic and filled and full, full and frustrated. Very much like Bethlehem at the time of Christ's birth. I want you to notice there was no room for Jesus in the business of Bethlehem. <coughs> I think John 1.11 tells us what the attitude was. He came to his own and his own received him not. Don't feel badly. The servant is not greater than his master. Don't feel Badly, if, if somebody doesn't jump up, jump up and down and say, well, what must I do to be saved? You know? Mm -hmm. I've had that, that type of an attitude maybe once or twice in my entire 40 years of ministry. Someone has come to me and said, how can I be saved? A lot of people reject. They do. There was no room for Jesus. In the business of Bethlehem. I got this letter from Dr. Gibbs yesterday. He gives us a legal perspective, if I could just share this with you, from that precious man of God. 2017 has been a landmark year in many ways. As our culture continues to shift, not just away from God, but towards a virulent anti-Christian perspective, or that's for sure. Anyone who dares to stand up for traditional values is under attack as more and more horrific sinful behavior is normalized. And he talks about the current administration's open advocacy towards protecting religious freedom and a conservative, uh, uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch, he mentioned, a conservative with the history of protecting the Constitution to the Supreme Court are beacons of light amidst a year of darkness. 2018, however, has the potential to be just as important as religious freedom continues to be under fire. Arguably, the most pressing issue is the Supreme Court case Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission. The outcome of this case will determine whether business owners have the right to stand up for religious belief by denying services that would disagree with those beliefs. Let me say this, this so-called gay couple who came into that shop, that precious man had all of these cakes that were in his case, and he would have sold them one of those cakes. No problema. Oh no, they wanted to force him to make a special cake, and uh, with, you know, all of their quirky stuff. 
He just said, you know what, you can buy any of these cakes, but he says, I'm not going to participate in that particular union. It's against my beliefs. And so, Christian, uh, the rights of Christian business owners have been under continuously under fire over the past several years, particularly for those involved in weddings in any fashion. Cake bakers, florists, and photographers. 2018 will likely be a veritable onslaught of new legal claims and battles over the boundaries where religious freedom ends and where the alleged need for protection of sexual orientation and gender identity begins. We will likely see continued claims in areas of employment, public ordinances, and anti-discrimination laws and more. Even the church itself may eventually come under fire as we have seen more than one state attempt to define churches as places of public accommodation, which would make churches subject to all state discrimination laws, which may now include sexual orientation and gender identity. So, he says, undoubtedly 2018 will be an incredibly busy... Why do I say this? Because just like they didn't have room for Jesus back then, in the first century, this world doesn't have room for Jesus today nor his righteousness, nor living a godly life. And so there was no room for Jesus in the business of Bethlehem. He came to his own, his own received him not. Number two, there was no room for Jesus in the homes of Bethlehem. No, true. Uh, <clears throat> the inn was also the innkeeper's house, right? He didn't have room for him. Okay. What busy places our homes have become. There's time for television, as uh, Roger Campbell says, honey. There's time for television, time for computers, time for newspapers, but no time for Jesus. I wonder, really, if we went across America in our, in our, I'm just, in our, in our fundamental churches, I wonder how many homes actually have a family altar. A time where they read the Bible and they pray together. Many a family altar has altered many a family home. I would encourage you as we see the day that's approaching. There's time for community activities, time for entertainment. And now with the onslaught of the this, this it's not it's not actually information anymore, it's data, right? Data. Uh, you have one of these uh, of pieces of plastic and metal, and m most of us have a, a data plan, right? How many gigabytes of data? And we have this onslaught of data, whether it's, uh, last night I was headed home and I had to stop by Fry's and the, the boy was pushing the, you know, all the carts back to the store and I said, is the store still open? Like he didn't even hear me. I got up to him a little closer. Is the store still open? And then he finally saw me. And, oh, he had to pull out the earbuds. Yeah. You know, so I could talk to him. You know, I said, is the store still open? Oh, yeah, it's still open. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I would like to encourage you to be careful about where doing that. Having these uh, iPods and sticking them in your ear, especially when you're walking. If you're an easy target for somebody just to come and whack you on the head. So you need to be you need to be aware and alert about your surroundings at all times, especially in this day and age. You know, these young people, especially some of these gangs, they got these well, they got a contest. Well, let's see if we can knock this person out with one blow. They come up behind them. Be aware of your surroundings. There was no room for G. I'm saying that we're so bombarded with all this data and information like Daniel said, right? Yes. Daniel 12. Yes. Knowledge shall be increased. Yes. Literally, it's going to explode. There's going to be this explosion of knowledge. But as Dan said, wisdom is not. Wisdom is not. That's right. Okay. Well said. That was a great insight. We got a lot of data and a lot of information and a lot of knowledge, but we seem to be stupider than that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Ask somebody about, uh, you know what, Mike, I was impressed with Mike, because he knew about World War II and the German tanks, and we were talking about, you know, uh, that was good. He told me about how they put, the Germans put 
uh, their arm and armor on the front of the tanks because they never thought they'd have to be shot from the back. <laughs> yeah. No room for Jesus in the homes. I want to ask you, does Jesus have room in your home? Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, he talks about the little hamlet of Bethlehem Ephrath, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth he that's to be ruled in ages to come. He chose that little hamlet hundreds of years before he was ever born there. Let's go to Luke 12, if we could. Luke chapter 12. Do you have room for Jesus in your life, in your home? Luke chapter 12. We need to make room. We need to make time, make room for Christ because he is most precious. <coughs> Here we find the rich fool, okay? Remember him? And... Uh, Take heed, he says in verse 15, beware of covetous, for man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possessed. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, What shall I do? Because I have no what? Room. No room where to bestow my fruits. Ah, he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns, build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for thee for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. That Epicurean philosophy. But God said unto him, What? Everyone? Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? See, he says, I, I will do, there will I bestow all my fruits. Verse 17, he says, I have no room. And that's really what his life is about. He had fruits, he had all of this stuff. And, you know, it's fascinating to me that in this town, this city, there's a preponderance of thrift stores. Do you notice that? Where does all this stuff come from, Lord George? I mean, they're all just jammed full of stuff. Most of it, let's, let's be honest, most of it's junk, you know. But one man's junk is what? Another man's treasure, right? Yeah. <laughs> I like going to a thrift store. I, you know, I don't know, if I, I don't know if I've got anything on from it, but nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but I want to say to you, your life doesn't consist of the abundance of things that you possess. Whether it's cars, or houses, or degrees, or, you know, clothes. It's just amazing. And so, we need to make room for Christ in our homes. Put some verses on the walls. Carol and I were going into Fry's the other day, yesterday actually. Brother Bob... We, uh, we were coming to the entrance, and of course, what's at all the entrance of the food stores right now? Santa Claus. That's Santa Claus with the, the building. Yeah, not Santa Claus. Salvation, Salvation Army building. Oh, oh, whatever that is. The guy who dressed up like Santa Claus. And certainly there was a guy there with a red vest on, and he was saying to everybody, Merry Christmas. And I appreciate some of the work that the Salvation Army does. Not exactly where General Booth was, but... Praise God, they help people, right? right. Mm -hmm. Brother Bob, we're in Rita Ranch, right? Mm -hmm. As we walk in there, guess who's ringing the bell? Alan Harlow. Alan. <laughs> oh, Pastor! You know, and I put something in his kettle and I put something in his pocket. I said, God bless you, Alan. And he looked at me. He said, it's so good to see you. Now, those of you who know Ellen, remember him and Prince, his dog. Mm -hmm. Oh, he loved that dog. That's the only, Debbie, 
And Tammy, that's the only dog funeral I've ever had in my life. <laughs> well, he demanded it. And the reason we had it is he guaranteed that a lot of people were going to come and I'd be able to preach the gospel. I said, eh, okay. <laughs> you know? I get to preach, right? Get the gospel. That's right. <sighs> Well, the time came. The door opens up. Well, I thought we were just going to remember the dog, right? Oh, no. He wants to bring the dog body in. And he was on ice and plops him down in front of the dog. So he, he's laying there, and Alan's crying over him. And then he gets up real quick. I've got the video. He's got a video, so we had a video. We watched the video of Prince's life and Alan Harlow. Oh my gosh. And I'm waiting for all these people to come, right? <laughs> but they didn't really show up. Maybe one or two. So I preach the gospel. So yesterday, I talked to him. He says, I don't have anywhere. The only reason I bring this up is he said, I don't have anywhere to go. He says, I live in my truck. I said, you know what, Alan? You can come over. This was after my wife went in. She didn't want to sit this. <laughs> I, I was willing to let him come. You know, he's ringing the bell, right? He's doing something good. He's not drunk. He's not drinking. Or he, anyway, long story short, he chases me down in the store. And he said, Pastor. I said, what, Alan? He says, you have to understand something. I said, what's that? He said, I still have the dog. This is a couple of years ago now, right? What's four years, right? Four or five, yeah. He says, Prince is still on ice over at the vet. <laughs> he says, I want you, you come over and you pray that God will raise him from the dead. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Did it work? Well, I just... I couldn't help but hope. I, I couldn't help but I tried to have a straight face. <laughs> I just broke out in laughter. I, I, don't make fun of me. He says, God's going to raise Prince from the dead. I know it. I said, uh, Alan? Are you sure he wasn't drunk? Yeah, I got three words to say to you. He said, what's that? I said, get another dog. <laughs> Please, move on. You gotta admire his faith. You have to admire his faith. Absolutely. Yes, okay. You know, he's probably I don't know, I, I buried Maggie 10 years ago. I don't go out there, come up through the soil, sweetheart. Come on. You She's gone. Okay, we got Molly now. There was another beagle who needed us. The only reason I say that is I went back after I went so visiting yesterday, and sure enough, I was I gave oh I went and got him a subway card and gave him a subway card. He said, "Get yourself a sandwich." Oh, he was so great. I went back, and sure enough, he was sleeping in the truck next to the store. And I was going to wake him up, say, you can come over now. He just, he was, he just looked so comfortable there. I said, okay, I'll let him rest. I'll go back today, and I'll see if he's okay. So pray for Alan, if you would. The only reason I mention that is he, he doesn't have a place to live. I want you to go to John chapter 7, if you would. John chapter 7. Yep, that was one of the mm -hmm. colorful characters from the path of ministry. Debbie. One of the many. Never a dull moment. He really is a precious soul, and I love him. The Bible says... <clears throat> John 7, in the last two verses. Of course, you know, Brother Frank, the, uh, the NIV, HIV crowd says these verses aren't in the Bible. <clears throat> yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. 
but we, we believe they are. The Bible says in verse 52, and, uh, they answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. What does it say in verse 53, everybody? And every man went unto his own house. In chapter 8, verse 1, Jesus went to the Mount of All. So here's all of these people who had a place to go. But Jesus, the foxes have wolves. The birds have nests. Some men have no one to lay his head. You know what? If you have a place to lay your head, be thankful. It doesn't have to be fancy. Let's just be thankful and grateful for what God's given to us. Amen. And let's invite Jesus into our humble abode, wherever it is. I'm thankful. Years ago, a farmhouse took me in in a blizzard. I was delivering a load of paint, from Zumach paint, to Wausau Homes in Atoma, Ohio. When I went down Highway 51, and it just started snowing. Blizzard, blizzard, blizzard. Finally, it got so bad that the highway patrol came and said, we're closing the highway down. What am I going to do? Sleep here and freeze? No. He pointed over. He said, this is a designated farmhouse over here. These people have said, you know, this happens. You're welcome there. So I got out of the truck. And as soon as I got out of the truck, it was so bad, it, it whipped me right off my feet. And it fell into this little... Uh, ditch and the snow started covering me up. I crawled up, got up, and I made it over to this farmhouse. And there was probably 20 or 30 people there. And I said, Lord, I said, the paint's going to freeze. It was latex paint. I don't know what I'm going to do. And they said, Well, you're down in the basement. So I went down in the basement. There was their teenage boy was down there. And I had the privilege of leading that boy to Christ that night. If there was no blizzard, I wouldn't reach that boy. So I'm thankful for the inconveniences of life. D.L. Moody preached on this verse. There was no room for them in the end. He says, For 4,000 years the world had been looking for Christ. The prophets had been prophesying and the mothers of Israel had been praying and hoping that they might be the mother of that child. And now he has arrived and find that he is laid in a borrowed cradle. There was no room for them in the end. He might have come with all the grandeur and glory of the upper world. He might have been ushered into this world with 10,000 angels. Yea, legions upon legions of angels might have come to his advent. He might have been born in a palace or a castle. But he just became poor for your sake and mine. He passed by mansions and thrones and dominions and went down into that manger. His child, this child... His cradle was not only borrowed, but almost everything he had was borrowed. He had a borrowed beast he rode into Jerusalem. It was on a borrowed cross that he died on, and a borrowed grave they laid him in. There were no hallelujahs from the people. He found there was no room in Bethlehem for him. There was no room in Jerusalem for him. When he arrived at Jerusalem, not only the king, not only the king but all Jerusalem was troubled. There was somewhere that did welcome him, though. And he went down to Bethany and was welcomed into the home next to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Thank God they welcomed him into their home. And because they welcomed him, what happened? When he was sick, and he was buried in the tomb. Jesus came. I was in that tomb. Let me tell you something. You talk about exciting to be in a place. You go down these steps, down, down. And there was the grave of Lazarus. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth! Lazarus came forth. Oh, what a day that was. That's because they invited Jesus into their home. Now, I don't know about Prince, but I know Lazarus was meant to be raised from the dead. Amen? And I rejoice, and I'm going to make room for Jesus this season, this Christmas season, and I hope you will as well. Let's stand together.
together. Father, we're so grateful. We're so thankful that Jesus came.